In the name of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, amen. Dear friends in Christ, it is possible for Jesus to be among us and yet unknown. John the Baptist said that to one of the crowds gathered around him. He said, among you stands one you do not know. On Christmas Day, the other John, John, Jesus' disciple, the Apostle John, reminded us of this fact in the great Christmas Gospel. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And even today in our Gospel, twice, twice, John the Baptist said, I myself did not know him. So God makes him known. So that John can say, the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Thus what happened in the Jordan River, that which we heard about last week, the baptism of our Lord, served to reveal Jesus to John so that John could say, I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. More, he could point to Jesus and say, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All things serve this purpose, to reveal God and his Christ. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. And the Apostle Paul told the Athenians, God did this. That is, he created the world. He, he determined all things. He works in history. He sends rain and sun on the righteous and the unrighteous. Why? So that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. But creation isn't enough. Creation and nature only tell us about God with a, a lowercase g. Creation and nature, together with our conscience, certainly reveals higher powers and providence, reveals might and majesty, reveals an almighty. And at the same time, it can lead us to so much other than Christ because of the weakness, the depravity of our sinful nature. Evidence? One billion Muslims. Hundreds of millions of Hindus and Buddhists and so on and so forth. The light that gives true light to all men remains a mystery to most men. But God must unveil it. Thus he gives his church and preachers and the means of grace and even the Holy Spirit, the one who teaches us the things we don't know, who reminds us of what we've forgotten. And these things, this church, her preachers, her means of grace, the Holy Spirit himself even, serve to draw attention not to themselves, but to Christ. To Christ. To Christ. So the church, then, is not about the spectacle, about the organizations, about the meetings, but about Christ. The Christian church and individual Christian churches exist to serve this purpose, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen from the dead, to publicly display to the nations the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Preaching, too, isn't about the preacher, his person, his personality, his skills, his abilities, his wit, his cleverness. But again, it is about Christ. That's why pastors wear vestments, to cover up the man as much as possible, so that you might focus on the message, so that you might focus on Christ. God's means of grace, his word, his sacraments of baptism and holy communion, these too aren't about the fine taste of the bread and wine, about the, the right temperature of the water, about the elaborateness or the simplicity of the ritual, but about proclaiming Christ. These things exist for one purpose. They exist to tell us the promises of God, to show us the promises of God, to deliver to us the promises of God. That he might be known, so he writes about himself. That he can wash away sins, so he gives us a bath that does that very thing. That he can feed a hunger, so he gives us a meal that's for the forgiveness of sins. Even the Holy Spirit doesn't just serve the Holy Spirit's interests. He spends most of his time descending upon Jesus, authoring books about Jesus. He spends his time as the counselor, the comforter, the encourager of the church, teaching us about Christ, 
reminding us about Christ, carrying along God's apostles and prophets to make sure they've got everything, that they've got every jot and tittle, that they've crossed every T, that they've dotted every I, giving them the very words that they need to make sure that Christ increases and everything else decreases. Because only Jesus and no one and nothing else takes away the sins of the world picks them up, takes them up, carries them away, destroys them, executes them, takes them upon himself, those sins that are attached to you, so that through faith in him you do not experience the punishment that those sins have earned you. And not just yours, but the sins of the world. Cosmos, as the Greek has it here in John 1. Jesus didn't take upon himself some limited few sins. He didn't atone for some limited few. He didn't die for some limited few. He didn't become sin for some limited few. He came and he took away the sins of the world. That's why we sing this as we prepare to come to God's altar, receive his meal. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on me. Because it's unbelievable. Can it be? Can it really be that this is for me? And the word proclaims that it is. In his lectures in Isaiah 53, Luther said, These words, our, us, for us, must be written in letters of gold. He who does not believe this is not a Christian. We need this word. We need these golden letters because John himself convicts us of our need for someone to take away the sins of the world. And he does it by making a similar use of those words, our, us, for us. Only now those letters are black and terrible. They are bloody and destructive. John called us to repent of our sins in Advent, remember? And he reminded us about an axe that is at the root of the tree because of our failure to produce the fruits of faith that faith in Christ naturally produces. He convicts all. Because all sin. He kills all. Because all are dead in trespasses. We all look to ourselves as the highest good and for the highest good. We all seek to serve our own selfish interests first. We all foolishly think that we know God better than he knows himself. And so we go out and do what we want to do and plan what we want to plan. We go where and when we will, where and when we please, with very little regard for what God says or desires. So John doesn't limit his conviction, his verdict, his indictment at all. It strikes all. Cosmos. And this verdict, this conviction, this indictment, this preaching of God's law, it takes nothing away. It only makes things worse. It heaps guilt upon us. It causes us, as Paul says in Romans 3, to be conscious of our sin, to perceive our sin, to see our sin. And so the guilt remains. In fact, it only increases. The law seems to harm us because getting killed hurts. And the law kills us with its accusations. It kills us as it heaps sin upon sin upon sin upon us. Don't hurt. Don't harm. Don't lust. Don't overindulge. Don't look the other way. Don't compromise. God heaps sin upon you without limit. God kills you without limit. And yet remember that God's grace is also not limited. This is how gracious and merciful your God is. Epiphany reveals this about God. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Epiphany reveals that where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Epiphany reveals that while the whole world is bound to sin, Christ entered the world to take away the sins of the world. As we learned in our gospel lesson today, not some invisible cloud cuckoo land, some fairy tale world did this removal take place. It took place very visibly, very physically, very historically. Christ took upon himself the sins of the world. He became sin, our sin for us. Christ took the challenge of being holy and righteous and perfect 
fulfilling perfectly God's demanded righteousness, and he knocked it out of the park. Christ took upon himself the challenge of becoming sin for us, becoming a sin offering for all the sins of all man of all time, and he knocked it out of the park when he allowed himself to be forsaken by God and nailed to the cross. And the proof is in the resurrection. God declared him with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. For you. For us. For our justification. Ah, but all of this happened 2,000 years ago. I can't go to the cross of Christ and kneel there. I can't drink Christ's blood. I can't put my fingers into his wounds. All of this, as Luther says in a large catechism, is done and accomplished. Christ came and did what Christ needed to do. It's a real historical fact, but that's all that remains, an interesting historical fact. Unless and until the Holy Spirit comes and delivers it to you, makes it yours, brings it to you. Or in, in Luther's very vivid picture, unless the Holy Spirit comes and digs it up, unless he comes and unburies this treasure so that you might receive it and enjoy it. Thus Paul speaks of faith. We maintain that a man is justified, declared righteous by God, by faith. And later in that same letter to the Romans, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Or there are the words of the Church Father Ambrose, a bishop in the northern Italian city of Milan in the 300s, whose words were found to be so good and biblical that our Lutheran fathers incorporated them into our public Lutheran confessions. But he who is righteous has righteousness given to him because he was justified from the washing of baptism. Faith, therefore, is that which frees us through the blood of Christ. These things the Spirit of God keeps in his quiver to call, to gather, to enlighten, to sanctify. And they work. John points to Jesus and says, Look, the Lamb of God. And immediately his disciples peel off and follow Jesus. They spend just an afternoon with Jesus. They spend an afternoon hearing the word from the word. And Andrew runs back to his brother Peter and says, We found the Messiah. Faith. Saving faith. In Christ. Righteousness credited to Andrew just as it was to Abraham. boggles the mind. It boggles the mind that God who whispered the universe into existence, that God who parted the Red Sea, that God who did so many incredible, powerful things would choose to tell us everything about sin and grace, about death and life, about Jesus using such immediate, such, well, let's be honest, resistible things. That he would tell us about Jesus in words, words against which we can plug our ears, that he would use a water that we can ignore, a food we could not eat, that he would assign the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, to work through fallible preachers, to work in a sin-ravaged church, to do such humble-looking work, that he would be willing to operate as the wind, going where and when he pleases, so that some believe and some don't. Ah, heavy burden. And yet here, here is exactly where God cries havoc and lets slip the dogs of war. Here is where God gets to work. He sends John. He sends John with water, with baptism, with a voice. He tears open the heavens. He sends the Spirit down upon Christ. He speaks all that we might see. Look, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I say to you now, pinch yourself. Pinch yourself. Are you flesh and blood? Nudge, nudge your neighbor and ask him, am I here or am I dreaming? You are here. It is no dream. You are a part of this world and thus condemned to die eternally in hell because of your sins. But you are also a part of the world into which Jesus entered so that he might take away the sins of the world. God, your God, your Father in heaven, speaks this forgiveness to you. God pours this forgiveness upon you at the font. God feeds you with this. He lets you taste and see how good he is in the body and blood of Christ at his altar. You, me, us, our sins, for us, for our salvation, 
And now it is no longer unknown. Amen.